Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, there's two things I don't like on a session. It's when people talk about story, but don't tell one. And people talk about interactivity, but then never have any engagement with their audience at all. So it's like we're here preaching out stuff to you guys, right? It's really bad news. So um, there's something called Glissa that you probably already know about, but the URL is up there on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. So it's glsr.it forward slash bve18. And what that means is that you can anonymously ask questions, which means they can be as weird or <laughs> genius as you want, and we don't have a clue who sent them in. So please feel free to do that, because I have an iPad here, and the questions will pop up like live as you send them in. Equally, if you would prefer to take the mic and ask a question, then that's cool as well. Don't hesitate to put your hand up or jump up and down or just shout at me, and I'm happy to share the mic. So with that said, we have a really interesting panel of friends here, I have to admit. I'd like to introduce firstly here, Martin Percy. And Martin's done some amazing things, and I asked him how best to introduce him. And Martin said for me to say that he won a BAFTA for shoveling maggots. So I'll leave you guys to dig into that one a little bit further. I'm sure it will come through in the conversation. Um, Belen, I'd like to introduce, who is the Chief Creative Officer of Conductor, but is also an immersive theatre director. And Femi Kolladi, who is a course leader at London Film School, so it's kind of more like traditional filmmaking, um, but is also the founder and director of Modern Tales, which by the very nature of its title shows an evolution perhaps from the fundamentals of traditional filmmaking, which is basically what we're here to talk about. But before I do that, I'd like to show a couple of clips which I'm told this will make happen. There we go. Okay, so that was um, one of Belen's projects, which is basically immersive theatre on steroids, right? <laughs> um, I just wonder, could you just give us a quick overview of what that was about and how it worked? Please? Yeah, well, uh, it was uh, for the launch of the th uh, fourth season of Game of Thrones in Spain. We launched a transmedia experience to reward the fans uh, that we wanted to make them the protagonists. So they had to fight and uh, demonstrate that they were worthy of uh, sitting down in the Iron Throne. So we had like live, uh, ev live events, um, battles on Twitter, social media, web series, and a series of different platforms um, that were orchestrated to tell a story uh, during three months. Over three months? Yeah. Okay, so in terms of a runway for that, to make audiences know that it's there, how long was that prior to the three months when it was live? Well, that was pretty crazy because we started conversations about doing this in December. Uh, and the project was approved in uh, by the start of February, uh, but the, uh, the um, season was launching in the very first days of April. 
So we had like one month and a half to put everything together. Wow. And uh, yeah, the audience was obviously already there because it was Game of Thrones and yeah. they had like a community already created around that. Um, but yeah, we had to create all the game mechanics to do all the shooting, uh, to orchestrate all the communications uh, in a pretty uh, tight schedule. But we actually managed, we survived. So you lived and breathed it for about four and a half months? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. In, it's okay. in my skin. Yes, still. I can imagine, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm just going to show now a short clip of a piece of Martin's work. Lifesaver VR is an interactive VR film for teenagers where you have to save someone's life by making smart choices and doing CPR. I think having it in VR makes a difference because you feel much more like you're in the situation and like it depends on you rather than just being told or watching it on TV. In tests with teenagers, confidence in doing CPR rose from 38% before playing Lifesaver VR to 86% after it. All those tested said that it made them more likely, or much more likely, to attempt CPR in a real emergency. At the start of Lifesaver VR, a group of friends are relaxing when one of them, Harry, collapses with a cardiac arrest. He will be dead in 10 minutes unless you Harry? do the right thing. Guys? What would you do? Run to help Harry now? or check for danger first. Watch out for the glass! You interactively control Harry? the actions of Harry's friend Louise as she tries to save him. Harry, the film Harry. experiments with different Harry. forms of VR. Harry. This first Harry. half is shot like a regular film, Harry, can you hear me? but you watch it in cinema. VR cinema mode on your Harry. headset. Call an ambulance! The phone's in there. No, he's just as mobile. What? You make Harry's choices speaker. by turning your head to put a red circle over the option that you think is right. Exactly, he might choke. In the second half of the film, you have to make more choices and do CPR. For this, we go into full 360 video. You have to push down hard two times a second. Your headset senses your movements and gives you feedback. Doing it in VR, I felt like I was doing it myself, whereas in a video, somebody else is doing it. There was one point when I thought there was no hope, so I thought I was going to cry. No, I have to do it! Shock delivered. If you make the wrong decisions, or your CPR speed is bad, then Harry will die. He's breathing normally, he's waking up! But if you do the right thing, you'll sense the thrill of saving a life. Lifesaver VR uses virtual reality to put teenagers into the world of a film and change that world. And it gives them the skills to save others in real life. <laughs> now I feel like I have enough confidence to go over and do something. When you do it yourself, you become really, really happy because you just saved that person's life. Pretty stunning work, Martin. Congratulations on that. Um, so, I know there's a couple of slides that you'd put together. I wonder if you'd like to just talk us through them? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I think one of the key questions is, what do you want your film to do? Now, if you want your film to just be entertainment, and at the end of your film, the people who watch it have had a fantastic experience, and they love you, and they pay you some money, then that's great. And I think most of the traditional rules of storytelling will apply if that's all you want your film to do. However, perhaps you're doing a project where you want your film to change the viewers in some way. Maybe you want them to learn something at the end of it. Maybe you want them to do something at the end of it. For example, take political action, which is one huge opportunity that no one's doing anything with, but we can come back to that later. Um, in this case, this was a film project which has been running for about five years now, where the aim of the film is not to just give a good entertainment experience. The aim of the film is to teach people how to save the life of someone who's had a cardiac arrest. Now, you might say, yeah, 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 so you put interactivity in the film, 
you made it kind of like a game, but so what, right? You know, you thought that was cool and it's won some prizes, but so what? So recently, for the Lifesaver project, formal medical research has been completed comparing Lifesaver, which is an interactive film, with traditional CPR training. So like when you press down with a plastic dummy, right? Now, who here has done traditional CPR training? Pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> even one of the panel, it <laughs> never happens. Okay, <laughs> exactly, all right, great. Well, because obviously a lot of film crews, you need someone you can do first aid, right. So, great, so this medical research compared the effectiveness as training of Lifesaver with that plastic dummy training that you've all, so many of you have done. And uh, it's been published in the journal Resuscitation. We can just scroll through to the next, let's push this. Um, and what they found, they tested 81 school kids in Halifax. Um, one third of them did Lifesaver, one third of them did Plastic Dummy, one third did both. What they found is that after six months, the kids that learned from Lifesaver tested as well for doing CPR as the kids who did traditional Plastic Dummy. Now, if you're at all interested in using film and digital to teach people, that's huge news. Try this one. Because plastic dummy training is really expensive. You know, those plastic dummies cost a lot and you need a lot of space and so on. So if we can teach as well with digital and film, that's really useful. They also found that kids who did both face-to-face -face traditional training and Lifesaver tested far higher than kids who did just traditional face-to-face. -face. So, as I say, don't think of this as something about Lifesaver. Think of this as something about the potential of film and video, as we all like to make it, when combined with interactivity to create a new, much more powerful form of media. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. So, I mean, I did do that. I didn't do the VR headset version. Right. You've got like a website version too. Yep. Um, and even for me, I've not done CPR training. And I was always concerned that like how hard you push down. Like, is it hard enough? Like, how do you know? Could you do more damage by pushing down too hard? Um, but even doing that on the website version, like it's crisis simulation with everything ramped up. And just the, the panic and the immediacy of having to do something with that ticking clock and you know you've only got a limited amount of time, that alone made me feel more confident in approaching a situation like that, even though I hadn't done the VR headset element. Just to add one point is, thank you, Alison, because uh, you raised a very good point there. Though that medical research is not on the VR version. That's just a regular version for iPads, filmed just with good, honest, you know, HD video cameras. So that doesn't mean you have to do VR to get that sort of effectiveness. You can get it with regular video. And just out of interest, where can people find that? Like, what's the URL to find that? Uh, Lifesaver.org.uk. There you go. It's definitely worth checking out. I thought yeah. it was really good. So, Femi, I'm going to ask you a question now. You've kind of come to this from both sides. Traditional, I mean, I know London Film School because I've been running some stuff there for them too. Um, it's really like traditional old school filmmaking, like going back as far as time, right? You said it. Please, though, right? Oh, yeah, I that mean, was my experience okay. anyway. Yeah, no, of course, of course. But then, so in terms of, I know there's evolution of stuff that's yeah. happening at London Film School, but comparing perhaps that in terms of traditional filmmaking with what you're seeing happening at Modern Tales, there's a transition because you've got a new breed of storytellers coming in, right? Yeah. So absolutely. I wonder if you might explain a little bit about what Modern Tales is and how you perhaps see this evolution of change and shift to using digital, using experience design, using emotional design, using digital. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I think um, traditional filmmaking still is also to be relevant, incredibly important, and traditional storytelling is still incredibly relevant and important. Um, I think what's interesting is that, of course, there are lots of really new tools that are coming onto the market in terms of the technology. There's just technology that enables things in a way that it didn't before. And, of course, 
you know, we want to be able to ensure that we can empower storytellers of the future to be able to use those things. So with modern tales in particular, what, and in many ways I think what's become very interesting about lots of the new digital technology that's come onto the market is the way it enables connection with the audience. So it allows us to engage with the audience in a very different way. So like with Berlin's work, which is very much about audience engagement and about getting people involved in a program in a very different way. It's not that these things didn't exist before, but they existed, you know, you know they would have role playing kind of, you know, away weekends and residentials and all those types of things. And anyone that's been to Comic Con, you, know, you kind of know people dress up and, you know, get involved. But, but what it does is it allows that to happen in an incredibly empowered way uh, and it really encourages people to get involved in a very sort of I think interesting way and I think for filmmakers that's a really useful tool uh, the ability to be able to work with audience and be able to kind of test your ideas out with audience and to be able to interact with audience is something that I think 10 15 20 years ago was much harder to do you know we were much more uh, beholden to the gatekeepers as it were you know in order to be able to get a program made or a piece of television made you had to be able to go and appeal to somebody that was sitting in a room somewhere um, and get them to you know sign off on your idea and all of those types of things and so that you never got to the end of that process so as a story as a filmmaker as a director as a writer you would write something or you develop something and then you could just stop at that point and it never gets to an audience which of course is the logical end of that process so so I think what's changed now is that of course we can do that really instantly now and I think that's kind of an incredible uh, tool for filmmakers to be able to kind of and in some senses it's it's very old school in the sense that you know if you go back to sort of you know the the antecedents of story and you talk about storytellers that used to travel around Europe or Africa and tell you know tales by the fireside etc where you're looking into the eyeballs of your audience and you're able to then you know, uh, uh, modify your story, change your story, depending on the audience. There's a very direct relationship with that audience. Um, so in a sense, we're sort of, it's sort of old, but it's also new. So, and that's, I think, my feeling about, about, about kind of storytelling now. I think we're living in a really interesting age where we have all of these tools that are incredibly useful, but of course, there's still the core thing about storytelling, I think is still incredibly important. I do think, of course, also that, that, that it, we have to define what kind of storytelling we're talking about. I think, you know, experiential type storytelling like, like, like Lifesaver, which I think is incredibly, you know, I mean, powerful. And, and anybody that's done VR, you know the experience of doing VR when you get a, a really good VR experience is akin to, I mean, it's a very, it's a visceral experience. You're like, oh my God, you know, you're literally, you know, clinging onto, you know, the sides because it's such a, a, an immersive and experiential kind of experience. So, but I think that's kind of a different type of storytelling to, you know, whether you're making a piece of cinema, a piece of television or long form fiction or those kinds of storytelling. So I think all of these things can coexist. So, so I mean, in a nutshell, I think, no, the traditional story, you know, forms of storytelling are still really incredibly important, but they evolve and they exist alongside lots of these new, new types of storytelling. I totally agree. And like the session title is, Are the Old School Storytelling Rules Dead? And I think exactly what you say, they're absolutely not. In a way, I think they're more important exactly. because we are kind of live interaction with an audience. So I think the fundamentals need to be, or the pillars need to be stronger than ever before. Absolutely. Um, and then maybe another layer of rules on top, right? I mean, like years ago, I wrote three books. I had no idea who my audience were. Two of them did end up being bestsellers, complete <laughs> fluke. And don't anyone read them because they were old and it's embarrassing. But the point is, I didn't know who my audience were at all. Whereas today, if I was to do that, they'd find me in seconds and have an opinion and have a voice which might be not something that I'd want to hear. So for me, I think the idea is that we all know who our audiences are. So you've got your students and you've got your Modern Tales crew. They need to know who they're telling stories to. For you, with the Game of Thrones, there was levels of experience from that. But you knew ultimately they were Game of Thrones fans. For you, with Lifesaver VR, was that specifically like for schools? Or is that more of a wider audience? Like when you created that, because your characters are all sort of like late teens, early 20s mm. kind of age, was that deliberately cast for that audience? Yes, it was. So, but <clears throat> that's just the fourth of the Lifesaver films. The first three are for anybody. Oh, right. They feature people who are over 25. Never. Can you believe it? There are such people in existence. Is this jobs for yes. these people? Uh, yes, indeed. So uh, that's for all ages, all oh, okay. times. Yes. So quite interestingly, there was a study done um, in LA a few years ago for Intel, and they were looking at um, levels of conversation between storytellers and audiences, which uh, also applies to brands and consumers. And it was defined that there's four levels of conversation. The first one is the broadcast model, 
which they perceived is dead. That is like 150 years of push media through television in the corner of your room, through magazine, news channels, whatever that might be. And they, th they thought that the broadcast model in terms of being like this, basically, and not listening back was gone. The second level is my favorite level, which is the I'm listening model. Um, and the director, John Chu, did that model with the Justin Bieber movie. So throughout the shoot of the movie, he'd release still images of Bieber on Twitter and just ask questions to say things like, you know, should he wear the black hat or the white hat in the next scene? And of course, they weren't waiting to see what Twitter said. They'd already done it and it was finished. But it gave the audience a sense that they were being listened to and they were important. And for me, with all of the work that you guys do, that's got to be at the heart of it. The audience have to feel that you're not taking them down a dead end, that their voice does matter, that they are important in terms of the interaction and the experience. The third level was the um, Welcome to My World, which was what Tim Kring did with Heroes when there was assets released about the show online before the series went live. And uh, the fans ended up creating a wiki which ultimately became better documented than the story bible that the writers had. And the fourth one was what Eric Kripke did with Supernatural, where he invited fans in to co-create canon with him. And some of the canon that was totally in line with his vision did feature in the series. Um, apparently 50% of the fans loved it and felt really part of the movement, and 50% hated it. Either way, he got loads of press, right? So it worked for him somehow. But the I'm listening model, I feel, is what makes things different. Now, you had said that you won a BAFTA for shoveling maggots. <laughs> but that was another VR experience, but that was yes. for much younger children. Yes. So in terms of how you approach that, I mean, I don't know what age, was it preschool kids? Yes, the maggots. The maggots. Yes. Right. So maybe yes. you'd just like to talk about the maggots, but also about the audience for that project. Right, so the lesson of this is be careful about what you say before you speak at a conference, because you never know, people might take it and share it. Um, so, yeah, so I did an interactive piece um, uh, which was for kids and it's about animals and again I talked about what do you want your film to do so what that wanted it wanted the film to do uh, was to get kids to learn about animals and to feel a sense of emotional connection with them so rather than just sitting there and watching lions what we did was we created something where we filmed food, meat, or chicken, or whatever it is, dropping down for the lions, and then we filmed the lions coming and eating it, and then we coded it, so that what happens with the final piece is, if it's on iPhone or iPad, you shake your phone, and food will drop down, and the lion will sit there and go, because it notices the, the, um, the, the food. And then the kid will have to shout the lion's name, Limon, chicken, and then the lion goes, hmm? It's like it's reacting to the voice and it comes over and it eats the, um, eats the, um, the chicken. The maggot -ish episode was when we were filming meerkats who are very shy and the guy shoveling the meerkats to feed the meerkats, he was just too rough. He just went boom like that and so the meerkats all go and run away. Uh, so I had to step in and shovel the meerkats shovel very the gently so we had nice maggot fall and that's why we won a BAFTA because, you know, the meerkats were so good. Anyway, that's aside. But so getting back to the actual topic, um, do we want to talk about the term, the story and how it's used in different ways? We is do. I was just actually yeah. going to go on to that because this is about storytelling yeah. and I know that you have thoughts on, I mean, you've spoken about the evolution of language, which I'd like to get to, but you have a kind of philosophy on the use of the word story, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think the thing is that the word story is used frequently in two completely contradictory ways especially in conferences about new media and transmedia and things like that. So, on the one hand, you have the use of the word story to mean, I went to see Star Wars. Oh, yes, did it have a good story? And I think most of you are film people, and you're very familiar with that use of the word story, and it means, you know, good, traditional, three-act thing often that, you know, has identical characters and so, so on. But there is another use of the word story, which you get very often in conferences, which is really just to mean an idea, a vision. 
you know, what's the, you know, what's the story with this transmedia piece? Uh, I'm not talking about Bellin's one specifically, but the story of this transmedia piece, and it's often a, a vision of something that's going to happen, you know? And so with the Lifesaver period, uh, or the feeding maggots to meerkats, what's the story of that? You know, it's really a very simple story in the traditional sense. It's more useful to think about it as an idea of an experience where you feel you are doing something. You feel like you are giving food to animals. You feel like you are saving someone's life who's had a cardiac arrest. So it's not, it's, it is kind of a story in the traditional sense, but it's more a story in the other sense, the more fluid sense of a, an experience where you feel you are doing something, but the key bit question is, does it give you an emotional hit from doing it? Does it feel satisfying to do it? And in my experience, if you feel like you are doing something, then it will have a good, satisfying feeling, but it's different from a traditional use of the word story. And I think that's where we kind of parlay into using digital and knowing who our audiences are. Because we used to tell stories and it would go down a pipeline and we had no idea what the people would think of it, right? Whether it was like sitting at work on a Monday and everyone's gone, oh my God, did you see that at the weekend? But those days have gone. So I actually believe that there's three things that circle story. There is the, around like a thematic premise, there's the narrative design, there's the experience design, and there's the emotional design. Because I do believe as storytellers, we are puppet masters for people's emotions, right? They're gonna walk away at the end of a film or a series or whatever it is with a certain feeling. And I think the things you're talking about in terms of the story where you're feeling you're doing something, rather than being a, like a passive voyeur, you're an active participant, that levels in those two factors of experience design and emotional design. Because sure. you use storytelling to the max, really, because you amplify those feelings. So with that said, I'm gonna move on to you, Belen, because in terms of immersive theater, you literally put people in an active role in the story. So it's not kind of like live action role play, but there are elements of that in there somehow. So how, what, like, what mechanisms do you use to try to allow your audiences to become the hero? Like, how do you know if it's too difficult or how do you know if you've like, set the barriers too high to welcome them in? What are the tricks and tips around that? Well, that's kind of uh, a very interesting question. Uh, the last project that we did, um, it was called Retrotopia. Uh, in back in Spain and we designed it uh, through a design thinking uh, process so all the, um, all the story and the script and the text and everything was uh, inspired by uh, interviews with people because we wanted to take theater uh, closer to millennials uh, because they are like kind of the touch of what they uh, understand as theater so uh, we were interviewing them we took those ideas and we convert that into into experience um, but obviously, when you say that a theater, like a theater uh, piece is interactive, they automatically think, I don't want to come to the stage and do nothing. Yeah. So it's like, it's the first, thing, uh, the, the first thought that they have. So it's something um, about the handling of their expectations, what's going to happen is very important, and ho how you promote the show, and how they make them feel that they are uh, uh, comfortable so they know that it's going to be amazing and it, there are going to be surprises but there's they are not going to be forced to do something that they don't want to do yeah. so for that through the design thinking process we also uh, had like the prototype phase in which we did like low res um, experiences in which we took the, like a, a group of four or five uh, audience members and we just uh, allowed them to play with uh, props or we just gave them uh, some clues and we just uh, have like a feedback session afterwards, uh, trying to understand if they were feeling um, empowered or if they were feeling uh, pushed to do things. So uh, taking that information of what, uh, how to handle their expectations and what they were confident about doing or not doing and what kind of things they were allowing themselves to do in a new space, we crafted uh, a narrative. Brilliant, okay. So there's a question that's come in. And just to you guys, the battery's dying on this iPad so you might want to grab it and charge it. I think it's about to go. Which does mean I'll have to hand the mic out for questions, which I'll do in a second. But the question is probably for you, Martin. What do people need to change or understand 
in terms of storytelling for 360 or VR films? What do people need to change or understand in terms of storytelling? Oh, can we have another <laughs> conference for that? <laughs> so who, who asked that question? Sir, uh, so excellent question. Um, let's talk about Star Wars because there is an awful lot. Um, I think the thing is with VR, um, think of it as put the viewer into one place and leave them there. And if you've got an idea like that, then it kind of works with the medium of VR. VR, like any medium, has its strengths and weaknesses. Uh, obvious weaknesses are distribution. People have not enough people have got VR headsets, but also editing is you really struggle with VR. The way that with regular filmmaking, you know, you've got this fantastic infinite flexibility to make things longer or shorter and junk people from wide shot to close up, back to wide shot. You can't do that with VR. Of course you can cut, but not nearly as much. So in terms of a concept that will work for VR, if you think, okay, we're just gonna put the viewer there and leave them there, then that works nicely with the, with the medium. Um, another key thing with VR though, is that if you're looking at cameras, given that this is a conference with a gigantic number of cameras on offer, one massive problem with VR is cameras, multi-lens cameras where you can't get closer than five feet to the camera, and so you can't really see anything. Um, but in terms of storytelling, Think of a story where you're putting someone in a place and letting them experience it really vividly, and that's what lends itself to telling stories in VR. Pretty nicely put in like two minutes. But again, the fundamental point is knowing your audience, knowing yep. the experience you want to deliver, knowing how you want them to feel, right? That's, yep. the, that's the thing that changes those old school storytelling rules yep. because the barriers are down. They can see us, we can see them, there's nowhere to hide, right? So Fumi, in terms of what's happening in modern tales, um, you spoke about prototyping in real time with audiences. Are you seeing that happening more? And how do you see that happen? Yes and no. I think uh, filmmakers are notoriously quite precious about their material. Um, so it can be difficult to persuade people to expose you know, material uh, at a very early stage when they don't necessarily feel it's perhaps ready or to be able to open yourself up to that kind of commentary, if you like, on the material. Um, I mean, our, I think, uh, 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 you know, our, our feeling is that, of course, if the idea is strong enough, you know, then it sort of, it, it can survive that, you know, and it's actually, it's a really important part of the process to be able to understand you're making this for someone. And that's a really important thing to build into your kind of, your, your mode of storytelling and your idea about what it is that you think you're, you're trying to do. Um, and I think that's true both of lean back experiences, so the experiences where the story is a story that you're told, and lean forward experiences, so stories that actually you, you get involved in and you are the participant or the hero or the protagonist of your story. They're very different experiences uh, and they have relationships. And just going back to the point you were making, Martin, about story, I think we have to decide, define each product that we're making, what is it, what kind of story are we telling? You know, what is it that we are trying to achieve? What exactly is it and who is it that we are addressing, as you were saying, Alison. Um, so I think that, that within the kind of mode of traditional storytelling, I think all of those kinds of ideas about how you manage information, how you manage tension, all of those things are still relevant in terms of conceptually, but how you do it in VR is different from how you do it in, in, in sort of you know, normal 2D kind of filmmaking. So, I mean, one of the things that we've been doing at, at the London Film School is looking and exploring you know, how do we create some kind of space or some kind of environment within which you can take traditional storytellers and you can, in terms of cinematic storytelling, and put them in a space with people that make VR and think, well, okay, how do you figure out what are the new rules? Because there clearly are new rules. You can't cut in the same way. You know, what, but, but you can still manage information and you can still manage tension and you can still direct people's attention. And that's kind of what the game is anyway, really, in any story that you're telling, where, you know, look at this, now look at this, now look at this, you know. And often in VR, I mean, I've heard often people talk about sound, for example, as a really key tool in being able to attract attention, you know, to make people look in the way, because in an environment where you can look, where the participant can look wherever they want to look, how do you get them to look where you want them to look? But I've got to say, there's a question that's just come in exactly on that. So it's your, you and someone in the room are psychic, because the question that just came in is, are there any given rules for storytelling through sound? 
So you're connected with someone here somehow. On some are, there, are there any given rules? Are there any given rules for storytelling through sound? I mean, that's what you were saying, right? In terms of using sound as triggers, yeah. that's within a VR environment, yeah. right? I mean, that happens in, in normal cinematic storytelling too. I yeah. mean, you know, anybody that, if you're talking about the conversation, for example, a lot of that is just about how the sound design works and, you know, a lot of the storytelling is carried in the sound. But, but within an environment in VR, of course, that's, that's incredibly important if you're looking to try to tell people a story that has, that where you are in control, to a certain degree at least, of managing the information that the, the, the viewer or the, uh, the uh, audience gets in, in, in a particular order or even in a combination of different orders, so that they arrive at a particular point. So we kind of go back to that very sort of traditional, almost Aristotelian kind of idea of storytelling as sort of cathartic, and that, that we want people to have a cathartic experience. We want to move people, we want people to feel a particular emotion and to be touched in a particular way. How do we guarantee that when there may be, you know, five, six, 10 different pathways yeah. to get to that particular point? So it becomes a much more complex and, uh, and kind of different kind of experience. So yeah. all of these things I think are really interesting and they're ways that, you know, it expands. Every new advance in technology has always kind of, you know, expanded the language of storytelling, whether it was television, whether it was the talkies, whether, I mean, whatever it was. Yeah. It's, it's always expanded, if you like, the kind of the language of storytelling. And I think we're in an age where that's no different, you yeah. know, um, both in terms of the technology that, that, that we can use to tell stories in and also in terms of the kind of the ways that we have to consume stories. You know, both of those things, I think, do affect what it is that we are trying to do as storytellers. Yeah. So Berlin, in terms of immersive theatre, you're like creating almost like a playground, which isn't dissimilar perhaps to a VR environment, right? Because it's a lot about spatial awareness and like ontological design of the space and all of that. Um, how does sound feature in terms of what you do with that immersive theatre? Yeah, well, I was actually thinking that, uh, that uh, VR actually is more similar to immersive theatre than filmmaking in the terms of rules and yeah. how it applies because it really needs um, that, that spatial awareness and where the sound is coming from, the lighting, and it's more like that because you're trying to make the, you, the, the audience feel that like they are there. So, um, for example, in, in this last project that we did, uh, we used a binaural sound for uh, the audience. So there was a, a moment in the immersive uh, theater piece in which the audience uh, were wearing uh, headphones. So we designed like a 360 uh, um, sound uh, environment that was um, um, uh, linked with the space they were at. So we created like that kind of immersion. So sound is really, uh, it's really important in theater. Normally with a n n stage um, approach, it's on, used for transitions and it's not, it's not really given that a lot of um, importance, but in immersive theater it's kind of, it's where the, all the emotional engagement comes from and it really can guide uh, the audience from, uh, from a space to a different space. So it's not, uh, it, it doesn't need to be the actors that move them. Uh, so it's uh, really important and it's a lot of exploring to do in the sound sphere. So how do you decide where and when to use those triggers of sound? Like when you're designing that space that people actually move through, when do you know, like where are the story beats that you know you're gonna have to give them an extra helping hand to push them through? Does that only come through prototyping and testing? Well, it's a, from prototyping also where uh, obviously uh, in that piece we had different uh, scenes. Some were uh, text driven, so you understood when the, where, when the scene was over because the characters were leaving the, the space. Uh, but also I think that um, the lighting, uh, giving cues uh, through lighting is very important because they don't know this, this space, so they want to explore it somehow. So it's given allowing them to do so, uh, it's like uh, sound and lighting can be like the cues or the breadcrumbs that you're just giving them so they can follow. And, and it's, if it's pitch black, obviously you're not going to move, but if there's a light blinking in, in, the, in the distance that's telling you, you are allowed to come here. And maybe it takes just 10 seconds for one audience group and a minute to another to give themselves permission to move. But I think that the, the rhythm of the pacing, uh, it's up to the audience. So you can leave the cues there, but it's ultimately their choice to move or not. Cool. So uh, thank you. A genre question has come in. Can you break the rules of conventional genre 
and tell stories through your own interpretation of the genre. So we've only got like three minutes left. So yes. I'm just going to summarize <laughs> that question. If whoever said that, I hope you don't mind. Are there certain genres that lend themselves more easily to this kind of storytelling that weave in narrative design, experience design, emotional design? Have you found in your experiences that there are genres that fit better? Survival stories. Very nice. Do you have a survival story where immediately, what's at stake? X is going to die unless you do the right thing. Uh -huh. Then immediately all sorts of problems about, well, why should I bother making a choice go away? So is that also like crisis simulation, would you say? Crisis simulation is an example of the genre of survival story. Okay. Exactly. Okay, because there's something big at stake. Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. That's why Lifesaver works. Yes, yes, of course. Yes. How about you, Bellion? Have you found certain genres that work better? Yeah, I think that everything that um, re reminds or just relates to uh, discovery or intrigue or things like that are really uh, pretty well, work pretty well because it's, it's uh, giving you like, I don't, if, if there's something I don't know and I'm going to discover, like uh, suspense or thrillers or things like that. Yeah. They work pretty well. I, I think that that for a VR or immersive theater piece works better than a rom-com yeah, probably. Yeah. So it really, it, it's, there are some genres that are, are really better than others, I guess. Okay, anything to add to that, Femi? No, I was just gonna agree with that. I think thrillers, obviously. I mean, I think that that whole thing about suspense, what's gonna happen next, the tension and the way of managing that, I think there is a way, so one of the sort of the early projects that we were kind of proposing for the lab that we're trying to create was exactly that. It was a thriller. It was about, you know, because it's all about what happens next, which sort of seems to be a, a nice convergence between traditional storytelling, as it were, and then being immersed in something where, you know, your life is at stake, yeah, you know, right. because you're in, you're in the game and you sort of think that, that that's, kind of a, that's kind of a really nice medium. Excellent. Okay, so I do think we need to wrap. I've got like 30 seconds left, so I daren't ask for any more questions. Um, thank, all, thank all of you for staying, but I'd also like to thank Martin and Belen and Femi for sharing their insights. So thank you very much.